This is Songwriter's Room, and I'm your host, Tomoko. Today's guest is Mark Nelson. Mark attended Philadelphia High School for Creative and Performing Arts and formed Boys to Men with Nathan Morris, but left the group and signed a solo deal with Capitol Records and released his first album, I Want You. Mark was also one of the lead singers of the group As Yet with La Face Records. Their self-titled album went platinum with hit songs such as Last Night and Heart Say I'm Sorry. While he had billboard hits from his second and third solo albums, he was also featured in the duet song with Beyonce, After All Is Said and Done, on the movie soundtrack, The Best Man. Mark is not only a crooner, but also a prolific songwriter as well. He's written for artists such as Pebbles, Tony Braxton, Brandy, Michael McDonald, Aaron Neville, Charlie Wilson, Tyrese, John B., and even his mentor, Babyface. CSAC honored Mark at their third Jazz Awards luncheon for the song It's On Tonight by Brian Culbertson. In 2016, Mark received an Emmy nomination for the theme song for the animated Christmas TV film, Snowy Day, performed by Boys to Men. Today, two lucky winners will receive an MP3 of his latest single, Sack Full of Dreams, which was just released in August by messaging me through my website, tomokomusic.com, and let me know which part of the show you liked. So can I get a whoop whoop? <laughs> whoop whoop. <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gents, please welcome Mark Nelson. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank How you. are you in New York? I am wonderful. Thank you, Tomoko. I appreciate you for inviting me to your show. I appreciate you for being on my songwriter's room. I'm so delighted because I've been a fan since your first album, okay? Uh, thank you. I so appreciate that. That is so sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. But first, would you mind giving us a quick 15 seconds live so that audience can get a little taste, please? No problem. As long for you since I was born. A woman sensitive and warm and that you were. A product's trust no one would test. But you have feminine finesse and so much more. You told me riding in your rocking gave me stuff. So that I have to move from hate when you drop me back down the cold, cold world. There you go. Ooh, that was my Stevie Wonder. You just put me in the mood. <laughs> Stevie Wonder, <laughs> Rocket Love, yes. I love the song. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yes, yeah, so let me start with this question. I would think that you must have been asked this question many times, but I still have to ask you, could you please tell us how you got started with Boys to Men and why you decided to leave? So, um... 1989 is when me and Nate decided to create Boys to Men uh, because in 1988, New Edition released a album called Any Heartbreak and we were in love with New Edition. Little did we know that uh, one of the members of New Edition, Michael Bivens, was starting his own company to develop artists. And so in 1989, my senior year, uh, I developed the group with Nate, putting Wanye, Sean, and Mike together with the two of us to create Boys to Men. So the myth and the, uh, the narrative is that I left the group, which is not actually the case. And I will go into major detail in a book that I'm writing called As a Boy, Yet a Man, that will thoroughly explain Ooh. What, re what really happens, right? Okay. But, um, but just to give you a little piece, Tragically, while we were trying to do a deal with Michael Bivens, we were signed to a local management in Philadelphia that because I signed on the dotted line as an adult being 18 years old, the management didn't want to let me go. And that's where it started to kind of spiral out of control and for me. And it was the most tragic and devastating thing for me not to be a part of 
a group that I created. Wow. Once that took place, I had no other choice but to take another deal with uh, Capitol Records to do the solo thing. I never wanted to be a solo artist. I wanted to be with my group Boys to Men, but that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. It is totally wrong conception that's online. Yeah, absolutely. And it will change once I start to promote the book and, and then just blast the social media world to let them know the truth. Yeah, because it doesn't make any sense that you will put together a group only for yourself to decide that you don't want to be a part of what you, what you created. You know? Wow, you didn't want to be a solo artist. No, no, not at all. I love harmonies. I love singing with others. But that was the narrative at that time mm. that, uh, you know, took its course. When is the book coming out? I'm looking to release it next spring. And you did audiobook yeah. too? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's going to be an audiobook, ebook, hard copy, absolutely. I would love that. I would definitely buy it. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. So, what about uh, As Yet? You, you know, I love the song last night, especially this part that you sang. I saw the sun, the moon. <laughs> The mountains yes. and the rivers, I saw heaven when I made sweet love to you. Thanks, pretty thing. <laughs> so what happened yeah. to us yet? Well, interesting story with that is when I missed my opportunity with my guys, Boys to Men, and then I went and did a solo record, the irony is that I had to go back and perform at the same venue me and Boys to Men discovered which was called the, uh, the Convention Center in Philadelphia. So I go to do a performance there. And when I was leaving to go home, there were a group of guys outside waiting for me. And they wanted me to help them with their harmonies. And this was in 1991. So I went to their house. I helped them do some vocals. And then I just left, right? You know, no harm, no foul. Mm-hmm. Until in the 95, I'm in Los Angeles. I had met Babyface a few times and I was working with one of his producers. And I get a call one morning while I'm home from the Babyface camp saying, hey, we j- we're signing a group to LaFace Records that say they know you. And we're interested in making you the lead singer of this group. So when I get there to meet the guys, to my surprise, it was the same guys I helped in 91 in Philadelphia. And at the time, they were called As Yet Untitled. Hmm. They made me the lead singer, took the untitled off, and we were now called As Yet. So a little bit I know that I planted a seed four years prior to being a group that I didn't know was going to be a part of. That's amazing to me. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we went on to do, you know, the, uh, the debut CD. Last night we did Hard to Say I'm Sorry, the, the, the rendition of the Chicago song, Hard to Say I'm Sorry. Tour of the World, Platinum Records, nominated for various awards like the Grammys and so on. And, uh, you know, business would have it. There were major differences, you know, between us, uh, which, you know, sadly pushed me to have to go do a solo record. Okay. And then I signed with Columbia Records. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to know how it's like to have Babyface as a mentor and what kind of things he has taught you. Oh, man, listen, the greatest experience of my life, when I was in 10th grade um, in high school, I had saw him sing for the first time, and I knew then that I wanted to work with him. So every year, I'm just following him, loving everything about him, everything that he's written. Again, not realizing one day I would be in the studio with him like every day, right? Wow. And um, I think the thing that, um, that was very beautiful for me was that he embraced me like I was him in the making and I you know and he began to groom me to be a successful songwriter like him uh one of the things that he taught me was how to structure a song Mm. and the power of the lyric Mm. the words you know the lyrical content you know um he would always say to me in so many words this is just my phrasing when you read a lyric it's almost like reading a letter that you wrote to someone. And if you can read that letter and it makes sense, you've written a great lyric. Mm. 
that's a great takeaway. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. You know, when I close your eyes and I, your natural voice, you almost sound like Babyface. Uh, you know, I, I would say being around him long enough, you know, you pick up certain, I mean, when you're so in awe of a person, you pick up certain mannerisms, I guess. Um, I, I loved how he could be in the studio and he made you feel like he wasn't there which made you feel comfortable to do your very best. You know, you have the best of the best in the studio with you and baby face. And it just gave you this energy to make you feel like you wanted to give him your very best. And so he was very soft-spoken, you know, he didn't say much. He was very silly and funny in the studio too, to top it all. But uh, it was always all about the music for him. So I guess I just picked up some of his mannerisms because I felt that was the way to be to produce the best quality creativeness that you could, you know? Mm. I heard that he was uh, writing 20 songs a week when he was coming out. You know, <laughs> well, when I was there at the peak, we occupied three to four recording studios in one facility all day. Wow. And one studio was designated for all mixes. So he had John Gass as his mixer. And he, John Gass would be in the studio all day just mixing records. And we would jump from one studio to the next working on records. I was there when he did the Waiting to Exhale, when he did his album The Day. He was re re writing uh, the As Yet CD. Um, we were working on Tony Braxton, Whitney Houston's Preacher's Wife soundtrack. Yeah, I've been on a lot of records, you know, Michael Jackson, the Get on the Bus soundtrack, I, I was on that as well. And yeah, he was a, a machine and he would wake up early in the morning, uh, somewhere around six and get to the studio at about seven. And that was the quiet time to himself where he would, where he would create songs uh, with the MPC machine. And if you looked at the MPC machine, you would see like 99 ideas. Mm. So he would just have ideas, you know, and that would be in the morning time. And then come like, you know, noon, it would be into like full production mode, you know, whether it's recording a vocal or whether it's putting a, a guitar down or something or another, one song after the other. He would start, kind of tweak a little bit of this song and then put that away. The engineer would pull up another record. So it was, yeah, it was a crazy factory. Oh, that's awesome. So as a songwriter, how profitable has it been for you? Have you always managed to get the fair share dealing with major labels? Yes. Um, when you say always, you know, my career spans over 28 years. Right. So in the beginning, you know, like anyone, any rookie, you had your bumps of bad deals, um, people not seeing your value because you don't have a name yet. So when you're working on creating contracts with major labels, independent labels, artists and managers, in the beginning, you know, it wasn't as lucrative as I'd like, as I would have liked for it to be. But then I learned that when you're in, when you're in a camp, when you're a part of a successful camp, the success by association kicks in. So I then had the ability to say, oh, yeah, I work with Babyface. That made my checks go up like crazy. Right, and right. And then I always recommend that you have a very powerful attorney. A lot of people think that the attorneys who write the contracts are the most important person. But that's not true. The most important attorney is, a, is an attorney who connects with all the different executives and managers and artists and stuff. That, that networking system of an attorney is very, very important. Mm. And I had the best of the best. I have Fred Davis, who is Clive Davis' son. Mm. And in the 90s, he was the biggest, big, one of the biggest attorneys out. And he was, my, he was my attorney. So, yeah, it was very lucrative. Fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, wow. thank you. So in this long span of your industry experiences, what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you? I say the biggest challenge for me was trying to learn how to balance my creative passion and emotions dealing with business and people. 
to me, any industry has what we call shadiness or unethical people. Some people lack morals and values that are good. And I was always a very passionate person, you know, which I think that's what made Babyface love me so much. He would say, I love his passion, you know, because I, I, I feel everything, you know, I was so sensitive, you know, so to have to deal with business people at one point, I had a hard time with that, being so passionate and creative, which requires very intense, sensitive emotions to be able to produce creative music and great songs with dealing with the hard-nosed business antics of the music industry. And, uh, and so I was a lot of times emotionally driven on that side of it as well. And the average person would call me hard to deal with, hard to work with. And it was only because I was pure. And so when I saw bad deals and dealings, I didn't, I didn't take that very well, you know? Mm. And then, uh, and so what they label you as difficult to deal with means you will not allow someone to rip you off. And that's what they really mean to say, you know? Right. But I had to learn how to be politically correct. And Babyface taught me how to do that. So the lesson was to learn how to get along with people. Mm. you know learn how to learn how to deal with many different personalities at the same time you never know what someone is thinking even if what they're thinking is messed up you have to be very in tune with your environment at all times because I had to deal with photographers I had to deal with radio personalities from DJs to program directors you know you got to deal with videographers you got to deal with fans your executives, your representatives in every state and every country that you go to. You got to deal with other artists and producers, and managers and, and attorneys and accountants and all these different personalities. You don't realize you have to do all of this just to do what you love to do. And that songwriting or being on stage, you got to go through all of these things yes. just to get to do what you love to do. And that was a serious challenge for me. You know. So you but like to work with other people, and you also uh, did a lot of plays and musicals. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, absolutely. Is that yep. why you moved back to New York? One of the reasons why, absolutely. I'm very, very heavy into film, television, and commercials now. Not just from an actor's standpoint of view, but I'm in film school right now because ultimately I love to create my own films. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, great. So let's get to the second part of songwriting. I hope you enjoyed part one. Please continue to watch part two about songwriting as well. And don't forget to click subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about new videos of Songwriter's Room, my new music, or Japan news series. Arigato!